Video games can feel a bit like magic spells. You write down an extremely long and tiringly detailed incantation, and then it all springs to life in a whirlwind of colour and sound. The computers that they run on are even more mysterious, filled with tiny little electrical pulses that somehow conspire to create gifts of dancing cows. These machines are the crowning achievement of humanity, crafted by the collective effort of millions of people over the past century, and they're incredibly complicated. But if we start peeling back their layers, we can find they're actually not so hard to understand. So how do video games even work anyway? On the most basic level, a video game is a moving picture, so in that way, it's like a movie. But of course, the difference is that you can interact with a video game and change the behaviour of the pictures. Consider a simple game like Tetris. These little squares fall in from the top of the screen, you can shift and rotate them, and your goal is to make full lines. Everything that you're seeing here is quite literally a moving picture. My own game, Patch Quest, is much the same. There's a lot more action going on here and a lot more craziness, but it's still a large collection of moving pictures. So let's make a game. First we're going to need an engine, a computer program that contains everything you need to design and develop your game. You can think of an engine as a game development toolbox. The most popular engine is called Unity and it's the one that I'm going to use. We can very easily use it to spawn in some images, and now we can tell these images how to behave by adding some rules. Once per frame, I will check the keyboard, and if the arrow keys are pressed, I will update the position. And I'll do something a little bit similar for the spiky balls. And I'll also add a condition for what happens when they collide. And now we've got the beginnings of a game. A crappy one maybe, but the same principles that I've used to make this will also apply to any other game you can imagine. You just have to build it up in increasingly complex layers. So, video games work using code and images which you throw into an engine and give it a good stir. If you want to start developing something simple, that's really all you need to know. But I've glanced over something important. Something lurking just below the surface. Engines are computer programs. So I've just told you that this computer program works because it's powered by another computer program. And that's a circular answer. So let's dig a little bit deeper. How do computer programs even work anyway? This is the Mona Lisa. Or is it? The Mona Lisa is hanging up in the Louvre. What you're looking at is, of course, a computer screen. If you zoom in really, really closely, you'll see that your screen is actually a grid of boxes called pixels. And inside every pixel are some even smaller red, blue, and green boxes. And all these little coloured boxes are actually quite a good example of how a computer works. Each one of them is given a number between 0 for off and 255 for completely on. And there's a number in between for all the shades of colour in between. So actually, this grid of pixels is backed up by a huge grid of numbers. These numbers are passed over to your computer screen, which converts them into a grid of lights. Close up, it doesn't really look like anything, but as you zoom out, all of it blurs together to create an image. And if you have the right numbers, you can create any image you can imagine. The same is true for sound effects. If you zoom in on a sound file, you'll see that it's actually a wave that wiggles up and down. This wave is also a long series of numbers and 3D models are designed using a bunch of coordinates in 3D space, which are of course numbers too. It turns out that everything that exists within a computer is backed up by numbers. Programmers might think that they're working with sprites, models, textures, and sounds, but that's only for their convenience, so that their brains don't explode. The truth is, it's numbers all the way down, and all the computer needs to do is follow your instructions and update all of these numbers. But of course, that too is a bit mysterious. Code is written by humans, and it's written in languages that humans invented. 
So how can a computer understand what all this text actually means? How does code even work anyway? It's possible to take any instruction that a computer can perform and turn that instruction into a number. For example, an instruction might look like this, 1, 3, 5, 10,000. The first number here corresponds to an action. In this imaginary example computer, action 1 happens to be adding, and the following numbers then tell you what to add and where to put the answer. So we add our third bit of data to our fifth bit of data, and we store the result in slot number 10,000 in our computer's memory. This kind of language is called machine code, and it's a language that a computer chip can directly understand. A program written in machine code will look like an extremely long series of numbers, so it's not very easy to make. But if we think back to when I was using the Unity engine, you'll notice I didn't write any machine code. I was able to write much nicer instructions in a language that's much closer to English. So what's that all about? Well, there's a hidden secret step in between writing your code and running it, and this step is called compiling. It works by passing your fancy code to another program called a compiler, which knows how to convert it into machine code. This conversion process is pretty tricky. You break up the raw text into symbols, and then you pass those symbols into basic instructions, and then you convert those instructions into machine code. That's a lot of computer wizardry. But once you've built it, anybody can use it with just the click of a button. And in fact, that is actually how new computer languages get invented. You just need to build a compiler that understands your new language's rules and grammar. So that's all well and good. We compile our code into numbers, and the chip operates on these numbers. But of course, there's still another mystery. Chips are inanimate objects made of sand and metal, so how can they understand what a number is, or make any kind of decision? How do chips even work anyway? Imagine you're a baby, and you're being taught about numbers for the first time. Your grown-up overlords will start by teaching you 10 symbols. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 0. With just these symbols, we can write down every possible number. We just need to combine them in the right way. And since we're using 10 symbols, we call this base 10 numbering. But computers use binary numbers instead, which only have two symbols, 1 and 0. Believe it or not, you can still use this to write down every possible number. 2 is 1, 0, 3 is 1, 1, 4 is 1, 0, 0, 5 is 1, 0, 1, and so on. Okay, so what's the point of binary numbers? Why not just use normal numbers like a normal human being? Well, it's because a computer is not a human being, and binary numbers are really easy to represent using electricity. If there's some electric charge in a particular place, that's a 1. But if there's no electric charge in that place, it's a 0. And this means that we can represent every possible number only using a series of electrical pulses. And electrical pulses are something that a metal computer chip can understand. Okay, so that's half the puzzle. Chips can understand machine code because we convert it into numbers and convert the numbers into electricity. But now we have to actually perform the instructions. And this part is a little bit more tricky. We're gonna need a nifty little doodad called a gate. Logic gates are devices that can take in a couple of electric pulses and then decide whether they want to output an electric pulse. For example, the AND gate will output an electric pulse only if it has received two input pulses. So input A and input B must both be charged for output C to become charged. That's why it's called an AND gate. And the OR gate is similar, but it only needs one input. So if either A or B, or both, are on, then C will turn on. And the NOT gate inverts your signal. So an ON becomes an OFF, and an OFF becomes an ON. Using only these three gates, AND, OR, and NOT, we can create much more complex logical circuits. If you've ever seen those videos where somebody builds an entire computer inside of Minecraft, this is how it's working. Using the redstone in the game, you can create logic gates, and when you put all these logic gates together, you can make a computer. So the gates are themselves made out of transistors, 
And this is probably a word you've heard before because chip makers love to boast about how many transistors they have. The RTX 4090 has 76 billion transistors. That is quite a few. And to make that possible, they can only be a few nanometers in size. And the chip makers have to use an extremely complicated set of lasers, mirrors, and chemicals to burn them into the chip wafer. These fabrication machines are crazy, but each transistor is actually very simple. It's a tiny little switch that can either let an electric signal pass through it or stop that signal. People sometimes call computer chips semiconductors, and this is why. The transistors sometimes conduct electricity and sometimes don't. They're semi-conductive. And so a chip is made out of circuits, which are made out of gates, which are made out of transistors. And transistors are tiny little switches that can reroute electricity through the chip. And so we finally almost reach the bottom of this rabbit hole. But if you'll allow me, there's another mystery that's even deeper still. What is electricity? Electrons are pretty weird little dudes. They're subatomic particles, which means they follow the confusing laws of quantum physics. They can be in multiple places at once. They can also teleport through solid objects. You can't actually see them because they don't interact with light. And you can't cut them open, giving you a half electron. But what you can do is feel them because they carry an electric charge. And this makes them pull and push on other nearby charged particles, just like a teeny, teeny, tiny magnet. If you can gather a bunch of electrons in one place, for example, inside of a metal wire, then we call their movement electricity. And if trillions of them do this, it can power a chip. The electrons hitch a ride through grooves and ridges carved into the silicon, and as they flood through, they pass over gates that can channel them down a number of different paths. We interpret their movements as binary ones and zeros, which are then combined to make a range of larger numbers, and these numbers cascade through the chip, billions of them every second, and flip and switch other gates, letting the program change and adapt as if it were truly alive. And eventually, they'll reach your computer screen and your speakers, where they become an app such as a game engine like Unity. All of this is out of sight and out of mind for the game developer. It took decades of research and engineering to create all of these transistors, gates, circuits, chips, and compilers. But now that we have them, all we need to do is press play and it all springs to life. In fact, you can develop within the walled garden of your game engine without ever needing to know what's going on behind your screen. And gaming is all the better for it. So, how do video games work? I've given you a bunch of answers, all of them true, but there's another answer that's perhaps even more true. They work because of people. All of the people who wrote the computer code and then spent hours picking out all of the bugs. And the people who built the machines that build the machines that build the computer chips. The scientists researching better lasers that can carve tinier grooves into silicon. The architects that designed the chip circuitry. The engineers who dig up the roads to lay fiber optic internet cables. The people creating better hard drives and better screens and speakers. And everyone that maintains and improves the Unity engine. All of the volunteers answering programming questions online. Alan Turing when he created the first digital computer. And Charles Babbage when he designed the first mechanical computer. All of these people are passing down a torch, carrying the flame of human dedication. Each of them making computers a little bit faster, a little bit more reliable, and a little bit easier to use. Millions of tiny contributions that together culminate in entire digital worlds. So that now, all of us can have magic powers. At least within the walls of our computer screen. Let's be honest, making video games is hard. Programming is challenging, and you'll need a whole bunch of art assets too, along with a spark of inspiration for the game's design, and a whole bunch of hard work on top of it. But despite this, they get a little bit easier to create with each passing day. And with enough dedication, anyone can start to learn how. Hey everybody, this video is a bit different to what I normally make, so if you enjoyed it, please do let me know by dropping a like. It also helps out the channel a whole bunch. Did you know that my own game, PatchQuest, is leaving early access next week? 
You can learn more about it by following the links in the description. I'll be back soon with some more videos, and as always, thanks for watching.